thank you very much. You'll you'll laugh at this. Obviously, clocks changed what a week or so ago. So when we booked this in, my diary was an hour ago, and I was sitting here an hour ago going, "Let's go. Where's Kip? Where's Kip?" Then what I was the like, "Fuck is this guy doing? Yeah, where is he? Where is he?" And then uh, I was like, "Google." Um, EST to UK, I was like, shit, I'm an hour out, my fault. So that I just sent a new link in case the old one, you know what Zoom's like. Um, you know, it, I, I was wondering if that's what happened. Exactly what happened. And there's my honesty. There's, there's, it's all honest here. It's exactly what happened, but we're I'm, here. I'm so, I'm so bad with technology. I'm so bad with planning dates and birthdays and anniversaries. Like I'm, I'm the worst. So the fact that we made it here, we'll just call it a win. It's all good, but that's that actually takes me down a route of one of the things I wrote down because go, I really enjoy your Instagram page and the, the, the content you put out, but your relationship with time. How, how are you with time and getting an, enough crammed into a day? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting one. I have a couple, I have a couple ways of looking at it. I mean, obviously, you got to have some sort of routine, right? Um, when I don't have a routine, I, I struggle and I, I get upset at myself. I put a lot of pressure on myself because I do want to accomplish a lot during the day. But yeah, there's days when <clears throat> you didn't plan it out very well and shit didn't go very well. But time as a as a concept to me is different than time as, you know, hours of the day. And so your relationship with time, are you rushing around? Do you feel like you're not doing enough? Uh, do you feel like um, there's pressure on you to do more? It, there's not enough time in life to get stuff done. So I have this interesting relationship. I, I kind of live past, present, and future all the time. And it's a, it's a, it, I talk to people about it and they, they start rolling their eyes at me. They're like, oh, Kip, what are you talking about? So if you want to know, I'll go into it. But, you know, I try to schedule my day best I can, but I'm ADHD, I'm dyslexic. So sometimes I just got fucking wing it. <laughs> do, do, can you believe when you look back, and I, I was astounded with one of your recent Instagram story posts when you said you, you kind of feel unfulfilled after your Under Armour journey. You, you, you're always looking at what, what's next. You're on the new journey now, the new, the new business. I, I couldn't believe that. What was the reaction like across your sort of Instagram when you put that out that you did feel kind of unfulfilled on, on what you'd built? Yeah, you know... Um... I was just being honest, and I think some people sometimes see the success, and and they and and they they're like they're almost like a little bit mad at you. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you've done so much, or anybody would give what you know opportunity to be in your shoes, and and I appreciate that and I respect that. But the fact is, man, like, I, I fucking forgot about that. Like, what are you talking about? What is what Under Armour? What is that? Yeah. Like, that's, I just, I forgot. Like, I'm on to the next. And if I'm sitting there holding on to all that, then that, that complacency or that um, condescending, I've achieved a lot mentality gets into my daily. And I can't have that. That's not me. I, I'm, I got a lot of shit to do, man. So you don't rest on what you've done. You kind of, Keep moving forward. I try to quickly. learn from the decisions, right? The, all those decisions you made along the way, those decisions are what you want to remember. Good ones and bad ones. And then you replay those decisions and you say, how can I apply those to new decisions going forward? And that's a tremendous amount of knowledge I learned almost 22 years there. Yeah. That's crammed into like a, a, you know, that's like dog years, a fast growth company. So I, I, I saw a lot of decisions um, but I, I don't sit around and, and think about like, oh my God, that's really amazing. I just don't. Uh, and, and there's some personality flaw there. I'll spend some time with my therapist on that one. Yeah, I'll bet. But it's funny. I'm now going to ask you, would you take us down memory lane a little bit? Because the Under Armour story is so intriguing. I've listened to you on a few podcasts in the Hands and Daylight podcast with Origin guys yeah. was just brilliant. And I've interviewed Brian and had um, Ryan of Order of Man. So when you came onto my radar uh, as 13 Pacific Waves on Instagram, I was kind of like, who is this guy? Dug a bit deeper. And then you find it's Kip from Under Armour. <laughs> can, you, can you take us back? I mean, those 22 years meeting Kevin Plank. Um, I know you've told yeah. the story a lot of times, but for my listeners no, no, over I... here in the UK, it'll be very interesting. 
Yeah, no, and I've spent a bunch of time over there uh, with our team, our previous team at Under Armour. So I, I love Europe and I love the UK and and we do a great, you know, the team, Under Armour team there does a great business there too. So there's a little bit of piece of uh, Under Armour in a lot of countries now. But yeah, it was like a typical um, collegiate, you know, we weren't friends in college, you know, so a lot of people are like, oh, you were buddies, you were guys were buddies. No, we weren't friends. We met right as we were getting out of college. And, you know, he had kind of came up with this idea and I was playing professional lacrosse at the time and he had these tight fitting t-shirts. And I was like, I don't know, man, I think I can help you sell some t-shirts to the lacrosse community. It's perfect. And I wore one and it was amazing. And, it, and I gave him a few shirts to some guys and I came back to him like a week later. I'm like, dude, I'll help you however you can. So I started packing boxes. I started taking orders all night long, working in his grandmother's basement, writing down inventory on napkins, trying to make sure customers got their stuff. And, and uh, you know, Kevin, I, Kevin Plank, the founder, uh, he is, he's, he's a brilliant businessman. And I saw something in him very early, just a drive to grow and be big, almost to like, something I was looking for in my life just to validate myself and he wanted to validate himself on like the biggest stage ever and so you know a year turned into two and and I did all the dirty jobs and two turned into five and five turned into ten and 20 years later I traveled around the globe a, a probably a couple dozen times and you know I did a lot of different jobs I could go into a bunch of different stuff but yeah, we weren't friends. It was really about the product was amazing at first. And that's what grabbed me. You know, when you try something mm. and it's just better than what you tried before and you're just like, damn, why didn't I come up with that? That's the kind of aha moment I had and a lot of customers had. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And that was the early experience. Have you met many guys like Kevin that sort of at that at that age did he think he was going to take on nike and reebok and grow oh. up to the size it is did he have that vision i've never met anybody like him really i've met some like really really well off people and people have done some amazing things athletes and business people and philosophers and artists i've met a lot of cool people i will say right now at that age <laughs> i've never met anybody like that and you know i i got to give him a lot of credit and i did a lot of hard work but you know, we, we made, we made it happen, man. It's, it wasn't because we did it pretty. It wasn't pretty. There was well, nothing pretty about what we did. That's something that's, that's spoken about a lot from people that have kind of made it, you know, you kind of, would you say maybe, or other people will say you've, you've sort of done them or lived the American dream that you've created something from nothing that wasn't there that other people, as you said, would have wished they'd created and you've taken it to where it is today. At what point did the third staff or the third team member come into play? At what point did you sort of really see momentum? Yeah, I think that those first four or five years were just a complete grind. Um, busy, but not like we didn't have big eyes to what the potential was. I mean, we were hunting, we knew there was some ideas that if we got right, that it could amount. But you know, you get past that four or five years and, and, you know, we're making, I think, 12 million bucks and, and, and then we do $20 million and then we, we go from 25 to $50 million. Then you're sitting there going, game on. And it, then it's really about, is that team the right team? Because it's not about what can I do anymore? I, I got to make sure other people are doing as much as I did at the beginning. And and we had a great team. I've, I'd say the first couple hundred employees we had were just some great men and women, uh, super dedicated. And did you sort of pick up your skill? What were you studying at university? What, what, what skills did you have? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, a six foot bong, is, is that a course? <laughs> is, that a, is that a class you take it? No. I mean, I was a lacrosse player. Uh, we, we lost in the national championship. I was a criminal justice major. Um, I, I took some pre-law. I wanted to go into the military, the Secret Service, or the CIA. So I was kind of going that direction, and then obviously met Kevin. So I didn't even really have any business background. Um, I naturally fell into operations and manufacturing. 
and then supply and demand and then innovation and product development because it's really hands-on. Um, you know, sales and marketing in those early days, they wouldn't let me near that stuff. At the end of my career, I ended up becoming the chief marketing officer and I ran all product and marketing. But that was many, many years. Um, I, at the beginning, man, I just hustled around the world, around the United States to make product a lot like the origin guys. That's why I love those guys. That's why I sit on their board. You talk about you, the sort of military was a route you were going to take. And I know that's because your dad was in the military, wasn't he? Yep, give he us was. Little, he was a Marine. Give us a little bit about that, but your relationship with your brother when you would go to new towns and new schools because your dad would move around. What was the sort of process of you and your brother? I mean, every two years you move, you know, find the toughest kid in the, in the, in the schoolyard and get in a fight with him. If I didn't, if I couldn't beat him up myself, then the two of us would make it happen. I mean, that's the way it was. You know, we moved, we were in Hawaii, we were in Bermuda, we were in California and Colorado and Rhode Island and Virginia. Um, we were all over the place and, you know, military kids, we were just kind of rough brats and my dad was a, a Vietnam vet. Uh, when my dad retired from the Marines, he was the had the most active duty of any uh, Marine at the time. Um, he was in the, the first desert storm. So, I mean, he went from Vietnam to the first desert storm. I mean, that is a career long military family. And he's a much different man now, but you know, when we were young, he was a hard ass. And he was a hard ass. And uh, my sister, my brother and I, you know, we kind of moved around and, and you learn really quickly. You got to adapt to new circumstances. I mean, probably the biggest thing I remember is when I moved to Hawaii or Bermuda, it was the first time as a white person, I was a minority. Hmm. You know, there was only 8% of the population when I went to Hawaii was white. And so it was kind of this like eye opening, like, okay, howly boy. Like, so those are just really good experiences. You can, you can, use in your business or your life down the road so like traveling around sourcing and manufacturing under armor and meeting new people that was like that was like easy peasy for me yeah was that something you took to quite quick and, and as the relationship built with kevin was it natural that you flowed into operations and he was on the other side did you cross paths at all was there fallouts what was the relationship like yeah i mean you you you, you rub each other the wrong way but i would say for a long long time it was very symbiotic because he's such a great salesman and such a great marketer. I didn't even, I, went, I there's no reason for me to step on his toes. Yeah, on occasion, we would, we would mix it up and he would bring me in on some of that stuff, but um, he would push me really, really hard to like get the best product at the best price and the best damn quality. Yeah. And then we were constantly bringing new innovations to market. And that's something I learned uh, that I'm always trying to apply in anything I do, which is innovation, whether it's your self-help or whether it's your business, whether it's your family, uh, whether it's your body, you got to be innovative. That's the only way to survive in this world. Yeah. Well, you can't just be, you just like what you're doing. You're just, you're grabbing technology, you're doing podcasts, you're being innovative, you're stepping outside your comfort zone. I mean, that right there, that's, that's the magic to a lot of stuff. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's something I, I, I'm pushing this podcast to, to take it global and go around the world and reaching out to people like you, who, you know, a, a year ago, I wasn't aware of you. I wasn't following you, but now I see the content you put out. I see where you've been. I say, I need to try and speak to that guy, you know? Yeah, that's cool. And I, I was, to... you know, sorry, we missed our, in our first uh, time frame. I had my, <laughs> my kids lacrosse practice, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm open to it. You know, I don't do a lot of this. I'm not a podcast guy. I actually like, doing something like this um for you versus doing some podcast that may be you know a hundred times bigger because i feel like this is actually more important to Thank me because i'm an entrepreneur and people are trying to get shit done so i honestly that i was i was pumped to do it thank you very much i really really appreciate that how, how do you think under armor would be different starting tomorrow in today's technology in the new age now do you think have you ever thought about that what would it be like would it be possible would it be easier quicker yeah that's a really interesting question I, I think in some aspects it would be easier uh look at social media and influencers 
and you can get product on people pretty quickly and, and you can get that, that name recognition pretty quickly. Um, so from that aspect, I would say that there's some things that are easier. The other side of that coin is there's a lot of competition that can do the same thing. Yeah. And so you see a lot of sports apparel, a lot of like um, performance apparel brands, you know, a lot of workout shorts, a lot of women's yoga pants. You see a lot of that. A lot of people, small companies, they look pretty cool. The product looks cool. Their marketing's pretty cool. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It is easier, but it's also more competitive. So I think the supply chain to scale and make really good product and make a lot of it to scale, that's really hard. And that's where people bump their head. The, you know, they can make some really good stuff. They can keep it niche. But the minute their consumers want more and more volume, you, you, they don't know how to take that next step. And that's a tough thing to do. And maybe a little bit of the same thing on your podcast is like, you, you know how to get to this audience, but how do you take that next big step? How do you have a million people watch you? How do you have 5 million people watch you? How do you have 10 million people watch you? That, those math equations are a lot different. <clears throat> and what, how, how did you know what to do back in the day? How did you know how to scale you it? Because we fucked it up. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, bro we broke it. It's like, how does your bike work? It's like, well, my, I know how my bike works because I broke it one time and had to fix it. Now I know how my bike works. I think we made a lot of mistakes, man. We weren't scared of failing. And that's, that is the recipe right there. Um. We got lucky. I think the timing in the marketplace was good. I mean, we came out with a tight fitting t shirt when MC Hammer was wearing loose pants. Yeah. Okay. So we went left when everybody went right. And so we we grabbed people's attention. Like, what is that? What tight fitting t shirts underneath your pads? So and now a lot of mistakes the, and some good timing. Now it's the done thing, you know? You, you sort of set yeah. that trend. What, um, what's the relationship like with now with Kevin? Obviously, you're away from the, the Under Armour family, but is it still sort of in good terms? Are you in contact regularly? Yeah, no, we're, uh, we, you know, we, we hit each other on text every now and then. I saw him about four months ago. He came up to the brewery. Um, yeah, no, you know, man, it's different lives, different people. You know, I'm a bow hunter. I'm an outdoorsman. Um, I grind hard. I really don't care about a lot of pretentious things. So we just have different lives. He's a good man. He's a good family man. Um, but we're just, we're just different. We don't need to, we always have that bond forever, but it's not something we, we cultivate on a, you know, weekly, monthly basis. Can I ask you about Under Armour's relationship with The Rock? How, how did that come around? Did, was he an athlete that you guys spotted early on that you thought we, we need to work with this guy? Or how did that happen? I mean, Kevin, Ke yeah, Kevin is a sports marketing genius. And, you know, he saw this opportunity as, as The Rock kind of transitioned out of his wrestling career and into this, this icon. And, and we had some people that knew him. And so Kevin just, you know, started to make a relationship, spend some time with him. And, um, yeah, we signed him for, uh, I think it was a seven year deal back. It was probably 10, 15 years ago. We set him for a seven year deal and it was a lot of money. I don't remember the total price, but it was a good, it was a big signing for us. And then he stayed with us. So I think him and Kevin have a good relationship. And I think the rock, I think he appreciates the, the kind of original Under Armour story, which is the grind, the work, do the work. You know, things are different now. Big companies get changed a little bit. But when we started, it was about the work. And, and like, I mean, I take it you've met The Rock and have you seen him train? Have you sort of, when you get around people like that, like Cam Haynes as well, sort of the, the people at the top of their game, what, what is it like for you? It's being... definitely inspiring. Yeah. I've seen Rock work out. I shook his hands once in a board boardroom. He'd probably never know who I was uh, today. Um, he's a he's a beast of a man i mean he's a he's a walking bear um yeah they just i don't know it's like how do you take that thing that those people a cam or a rock or a tom brady or a steph curry or a, you know obviously some amazing women like lindsey vaughn um 
how do you take that little thing they have that makes them just go and like inject it into yourself? It doesn't work that way, man. It, you're a product of your circumstances. It's something in their circumstances early in life created what they are now. And that's the fucking fact. If their circumstances were different, they would be different. There's no innate, I'm born a God. I'm born the rock. He was made out of circumstances and he took advantage of those circumstances and he ran with it. And you, it's pretty amazing what people can do, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, he's someone that I, you know, I watch the videos. There, there is a lot of inspiration to take from that. When does the guy sleep, you know, takes his gym everywhere. He's obviously got a lot of, he's got resources let's say let's say it that way but yeah he's got he money started, he started somewhere you know he started somewhere whether that's his dad or the foundation yeah i background. mean you can, people can use that money thing right like oh look he can do all he can work out he can eat right he's got trainers and well fuck he was doing all that before he, he didn't have any of that and i i just uh, i'll send you a picture later um on my phone i just drilled a hole in a tire i'm gonna drag a tire up and down my driveway that fucking tire was free. I had a drill bit. I'm going to drag a tire up and down the driveway. Well, I'm going to send you, you a picture. Do, you, I'm going to send you, you a picture back. You can do anything you want. I'm going to send you a picture what back of the tire that I flip and I smack with a sledgehammer. That's in the back garden. Yeah, yeah I mean, I saw it. I saw it. You're right. It's, it's basically you can use what's you around you. Shit. Yeah, absolutely. So talk about your training. How's your arm? How's the recovery going? It's been mentally, it's been tough. Physically, it's it's doing great. Uh, it's ahead of schedule, uh, shooting my bow, lifting. Um, I'm right at eight and a half weeks from uh, bicep surgery. So it's going good. I feel great. But mentally, you know, I'm 48. I turned 49 in October. Fuck, mentally, it's been like, God damn, when, when you can't use your arm, it's just a I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but mentally it got me down, got me a little depressed, but physically it's doing great. I'm way ahead of schedule. The doctor's basically like telling me I can't do shit. And I'm like, no, man, I'm good. Like we're, 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 we're moving forward. We're not sitting here babying this thing anymore. So I got that. I got past kind of some of the physical barriers, but the mental stuff was a drag. Let's hope your doctor isn't watching your Instagram because you're smashing it on Instagram. <laughs> No, I don't think he, yeah, I don't think I, uh, I'm a private account, so I don't think I let him in. Oh, man. Um, would you go into a little bit of the, the headspace that you, you battled with? I mean, is that a new thing for you? You must have had injuries years ago with lacrosse and things like that, but is it is it difficult now, now and even going back to when we mentioned time at the start of the podcast, do you feel that you, you're losing, you're losing out? I can't do the things I want to do. Is it frustrating? Yeah, no, I've had a bunch of a bunch of surgeries. I uh, tore my ACL, my Achilles, my pec muscle, my bicep, and I have a two-inch fake vein in my artery. So, so I get the physical therapy and I get the dedication to like do the surgery, stay with the physical therapy, follow through, and it's going to be okay. And most of my injuries have not bothered me at all. You just got to put the time in. The mental side of this one was, yeah, I think I'm up there in age you know, my arms doing things with my hands. I'm such a hands-on person and, and manipulating things. And then my workouts, I was, I was big into push-ups and pull-ups and just doing the basics. And then you take that all away. And it's, I really took a while. Okay. So here's the truth. I took, I was depressed and it took me, it took me four or five weeks to turn that into being grateful to show me that I needed to focus on my legs and my core. And as you get up in age, that's exactly what you need to do in life. I mean, everybody wants the guns, right? And everybody wants, you know, the pecs. But at the end of the day, when you start getting up there, like I said, I'm 48, it's a blessing, man. So I'm really, I'm hammering my legs and core, hammering. Yeah. I've just started to introduce some upper body stuff, but I, yeah, man, I was depressed. It was like, this fucking sucks. Why, why did this happen to me? You know, typical stuff people say to themselves, I'm, I'm no different. What was it like firing, shooting your bow for the first time since, uh, since the operation? 
But you know, what's funny is I, I waited a long time. You know, there, I could have kind of started a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I waited eight and a half weeks. Um, I felt great. It was good. It was a little jerky. I'm not very smooth yet with my muscles. Uh, that muscle memory is kind of lost a little bit. So I'm getting ready to go shoot in a little bit. Um, it felt good, man. It felt like uh, it was like washed over me. Like, okay, you made it through this. Yeah. What, did did yeah. you launch? Did you launch the hunting range and the camel range and Under Armour? Was that was that kind of yeah. your baby? Yeah, I worked for. I did sourcing and manufacturing for maybe 13, 14 years, and then I went to Kevin and I said, "I'm done. I'm out. I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore." I said, "You either give me." my own division so I can run it A to Z like a small company or I'm, I'm out. And uh, he's like, well, what are you talking about? You know, he's giving me a hard time. And we finally sat down and figured something out. And, and I, I created the first um, sports specific division at Under Armour called Outdoor. And that's uh, hunting, fishing, camping, and skiing and snowboarding. And uh, we took it from about, I don't know. It was about fourteen million dollars to about three hundred and fifty million dollars. Yeah. It was a it was a fun time, man. And we just focused on that consumer, and I, I like that consumer. I and am that consumer. You are that consumer. So you kind of designed a, a brand that suited you. Did you bring a, a a strong team in with you, or did you have the the sort of vision already? I mean, I had the vision, but no, we had some great guys. My brother worked there. There was a bunch of guys. Obviously, athletes like Cam were there at the early stage. So, I mean, no, we had a great team and, and we had fun, man. We just, we broke kind of off. Now it, it went for a circle because we kind of broke away from the company and created our own little thing. And then they dragged it back in because we were doing so well. Um, so everything good kind of comes to an end, but yeah, we, we did our thing. We had fun, man. It's a, it's, it's a passionate space to be involved in. There may be listeners here in the UK and Scotland that aren't familiar with Cam Haynes. Can you give a, a little bit of an intro? And I, I think people definitely should follow him. But how did you find him? Did you know him before you set up that range, or was he someone that was that came on the radar? Yeah, we had this um, we had this creative guy that worked in our marketing department. He actually was not in the outdoor space. He was working for the Under Armour big brand, not in the outdoor business. And he was a mountain biker and trail runner. And he came to me and he said, hey, you got to sponsor this guy, this mm -hmm. bow hunter in Oregon. And I'm like, what? So actually, Brian Boring is his name, brought him to, to me and some other people. And I was like, wow, this dude's a stud. Like, let's sign him. Mm -hmm. You know, but Cam wasn't really known back then. He was writing a little bit and um, he was just trying to make a name for himself. And, um, you know, he's over the last 15 years, he's turned it up a whole nother level and if anybody doesn't know him and and i was so you have some listeners they're like who's cam Haynes? all i can say is if i told you a guy ran a marathon every day and he lifted seriously lifted every day and he shot his bow every day and he did all of this so he could be the best hunter bow hunter you probably wouldn't believe me. So if you don't believe me, you should go check this dude out because yeah. he is actually a real person. He's, he's legit and his conversations with Rogan and all these sorts of things, inspiring conversations, but even just his Instagram is brilliant. His training sessions with David Goggins are insane. I mean, that, that yeah, content no, is just brilliant. It's a whole nother level, dude. A whole nother level. I saw the, um, the video that Goggins put out the other day that he, he now will wear Cam's trainers, his, uh, his sneakers. Yeah, yeah. I have some history with with Goggins. When we first started the outdoor division, we were trying to sign people. We sent them a pair of Under Armour running shoes. And they showed up late to his first, I think, 50-mile uh, race he did in San Diego. <laughs> they showed up late, and he didn't wear them. Um, and, and we were like, hey, why didn't you wear them? Or he was like, dude, you're your shit didn't show up on time. It's not my problem. 
and uh, that was the end of the conversation. He didn't wear our shoes. I think he went out and bought some shoes. So he's a he's he's hardcore, dude. He's oh, hardcore. He's a different level. He is an absolute different human being, isn't he? But but those yeah. guys, what's it like on a hunt with Cam? I mean, when when you're there with him and he's doing his thing. Yeah, I mean, I, for one, I've learned a lot of things from Cam. He's a great bow hunter, a uh, great outdoorsman. Um, so I've learned a lot and I make jokes with him. I, I don't have to learn a lot. I just copy what he does. And I'll be pretty good if I copy what he does. So I copy his bow and his release. And I don't care what, you know, whatever he's got, I've been copying. Uh, so it's a little bit of a joke. But yeah, no, we have a great time. You know, um, you know, I had a corporate job for a long, long time and I couldn't dedicate significant amount of time to hunting and now that i've pulled away from corporate america you know i'm that's it man i i live on the road during elk season and deer season and i freaking love it but talk to me about the grizzly you've got uh you've got a grizzly on the radar yeah so cam and i do a lot of bear hunting up in alberta but that's for black bears with a guy named johnny rivets um and so, you know, Cam has, has shot a, a grizzly bear with his, uh, his, his best friend, Roy, who passed away. Him and Roy used to hunt grizzlies together. And it's a bucket list thing for me. I got, a, I got a bear tattoo on my arm when I was like 18. I never thought I would have the balls to go do it with a bow. Um, and I just threw out to him about a couple of years ago. I said, hey, man, I'm going to buy you and I a bear hunt. And uh, we're going to go hunt grizzlies together. He's like, yeah, all right. And so it's here. We're going. May 21st, we're going to Alaska. And we're hunting some, some, some wild beasts. You spoke pretty honestly about the grizzlies on the Hands and Daylight podcast about if the bow doesn't work and the grizzly gets you. I mean, you, you think that's a, an okay way to go? Well, two years ago, I was in the same spot. And uh, a rifle hunter made a bad shot on a bear and they went in looking for him and the guide got mauled half to death. Uh, and I was about 20 miles away and, and we had to help uh, on the radio to get a helicopter in and get him out. And uh, you, it's, a good, it's a good reminder. One, we're all a part of nature. We're, even if you live in the city, you're a part of nature. And then two, you never know what's gonna happen. You gotta be ready. Um, I think bow hunting, you know, is pretty safe if you do it the right way, but they're a bear, man. Like you can't predict what's going to happen. So you got to be ready. I'm definitely scared. I would be lying to you if I said I was, oh yeah, I'm not scared. This is going to be easy. I don't know. I'm, I'm fucking nervous. You got to get 20, 25 yards and you got to stick an arrow in his heart. It's, it's intense. Is it, has Cam yeah. has Cam killed a grizzly before? Has he has he done that? Before? Yeah, he's, I think he's killed two. Really, really. Yeah. Is it rare? I mean, is it is it rare or is that? I mean, elk I know you about. You know, it here. so Alaska Alaska has a lot of brown bears and grizzlies, and the place we're hunting, you know, we're gonna see a lot of bears. There's a lot of bears. The only reason we're allowed to get a tag is there's actually too many bears. The bears are eating all the moose calves and all the caribou calves, and they're hurting the moose population and the caribou population. And so I think this area, they do three spring bears and three um, fall bears. So there's six tags for the whole year. And it's like, I don't know, a half a million acres. Oh. And there's bears everywhere. They're everywhere. And uh, so this is more of a management practice. Um, it's a good conservation. So we're looking for an older mature bear who's kind of past his prime. Um, and we're gonna try to help control the population. And that, that's what this hunt's about. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's freaking epic, man. It's, it's giving me goosebumps thinking about I'm flying back in. What's your family's thoughts when you sort of got into that dangerous situation? Yeah, you know, I think uh, everybody that knows me knows me. I'm going to do you're what cool. I'm going to do. You're all in. So you can, you can support me or, or I don't know. That's it. Yeah, it's foolish. I say this jokingly, but I mean, it's a pretty badass story. If some kids ask, you know, how did your dad die? <laughs> yeah. 
And he said, well, he was actually hunting grizzlies in Alaska and, and he got attacked by a grizzly. How did your dad die? Well, you know, he's hit by a car or he's, he's I don't know, he had a heart attack or he got cancer. Or, I don't know. And yeah. I feel for anybody that's lost their father. I still have my father. My, my mother passed away when she was young, when she was uh, 52 from cancer. And I think ever since then, man, I just, I live a, I live a full life. Yes, you're not risk averse. You'll you'll take on your challenge. No, like I understand people that want to be safe and they and they want to kind of live a a a certain way, and I respect that, and um, I'll support them, and and I hope they support me. What's your relationship with wolves? You've been posting a lot about wolves and things like that, and the white wolf. What's what's that? Is that something that you? I mean. A wolf is a very, so it's, it's a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, it's a metaphor for myself. Wolves are highly misunderstood. Um, they're kind of aloof. Uh, they like to be alone. They have a small circle, a pack. Um, when you look at a wolf's life, it's about as close to my life as you can. I mean, that's me. I'm just, I'm not like some superhuman, like run in the woods all day long and I'm not a wolf from that mentality, but if you look at the metaphor, uh, you know, I'm a, I have a, I have a, I can be hard on people. I can be really, really like, I want to get shit done. And so, yeah, I just have a wolf's mentality. It's a metaphor, you know, yeah. I'm sure people think it's a little cheesy. I have never lived a life where I cared what other people think about me. So and how do you think you've you've why have you been like that when so many people aren't you know so many because i was alone when i was young and you had to i had to uh, i was my dad left us when he was when i was sixth fifth grade so what 12 years old yeah you're you grow up without a father i mean there was no facetime there was no text message there was no instagram I saw my dad maybe once or twice a year and uh, I love him to death. I, I don't hold anything against him um, or my mother. Um, my parents split and I had no dad. And so I became my own man. I had to figure shit out myself. I was alone and I had to create my own personality in my head to like make myself special, to make myself important, to make, sh- to make myself feel validated. I had to go be the hardest hitting lacrosse player. I had to work my ass off to make teams. I had, I was not smart. I had to work my ass off to be good in school. Like, and I had no one there to help me. And so when you do that, I don't know, like you kind of build a confidence, like, fuck, I can do this without people. So why do I care what people think of me? What were you like in a boardroom? Were you, were you, a, a, I can't imagine you were sort of quiet and sit, but would you just no, speak up? No, no, I was you speak hard, up? I'm a hard ass, man. Yeah. No, I, I have a strong opinion. Um, I got what I think is some pretty good street smarts and uh, I learn fast. I'm, I'm dyslexic and I'm probably undiagnosed ADHD when I was younger and, and still as an adult. I I learn much different. I learn through experiences. I can't read books. I I don't do, I can't sit there and look at math. Like uh, I just learn differently. So yeah, no, I have a strong opinion. I, I, I like to listen to people that have a voice. So I like to listen and I, I take it all in, but then you got to make decisions and go, you got to go. And and see when you, when you say go, when you were, planning on leaving how, how far ahead of actually leaving Under Armour did you know it was on the cards that you knew you were going to change um, yeah you know I think I burned myself out and uh, I thought I was better than I was and I basically started making bad decisions that's it man like I didn't leave like because I was like I made this perfect timing in life and like, I'm ready for the next thing. I want to move on. I fucking blew a gasket. Yeah. 
Of, yeah, as, I as ran out team, of gas. What, what kind of, I mean, how big were the bad decisions? Was it with team members? Was it ordering? Was it what at what level? Yeah, bad shit, man. Like not good. No. Like stuff you don't want to repeat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, you knew it was time I to thought, go. Yeah, it's time to go. Um I'm not ashamed of it, but I definitely had a lot of guilt for a long time. You know, I don't like to let people down and I had four or 5,000 people working for me and I was a co-founder and uh, yeah, I mean, I felt like I let a lot of people down. And so I had to step back and be like, well, what's going on? And uh, it took me a couple of years. It wasn't like fix overnight. Uh, I still, I still struggle with some things. So yeah, I'm, that's why I write weird poems on Instagram. It's why I kind of have like a dark and moody side sometimes. Like I just acknowledge it and, and try not to hide it and then just get back to work. Are like there comparisons? Not, it can't be all peach. Are there comparisons to athletes finishing their career? I mean, could you, could you look at it that way that you may be into a bit of a no man's land or coming at the end of your career that you're not sure what path you're going to go next? Was there any of that in it? Yeah, I think you, you, yeah, you lose your identity a little bit, you know, it's hard. It's hard to explain to people because it is a, it's an amazing accomplishment. And if you just look at it from the outside and be like, wow, you did what? Yeah. But then like, if you know me well, it's like all dark and stormy and it's like, you're like, so I think it's your ego. I think you can trace a lot of this back to your ego, needing to feed your ego. And ego is good, but it's also very, very bad. Well, how do you check your ego? What have you got? Have you checked your ego now? Have you, have you changed the way you look at things? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think um, you surround yourself with good people. Uh, surround yourself with people who challenge you and they respect you but they don't kiss your ass, um, but they're not negative. They're not down on you. They're, they're supportive, but they're challenging. And that is a, that's a hard individual to find. I mean, think about all the people in your life and think about they're challenging. They challenge me every day to get better, get better, but they're really supportive and positive. Hmm. That's fucking hard to find. Yeah, no, it is. So I would say the people you surround yourself, it's yeah. critical. And what are you like with other people? What if you see someone, I, mean, well, I want to get onto your new business, Big Truck Farms, but what if you find somebody that you think has got potential? Are you, are you a good mentor? Are you a good leader in the fact that you can bring them on without that being hard on them with sort of them not knowing that you're doing it for the, the bet, to better them and to, for the good of them? Yeah, that, that's a really intelligent question. Um, I think at Under Armour, I did that very well over the years. And at the end, I, I did, was not a great uh, mentor. Right now, I'm not doing a lot of that. Right now, I I'm, I'm, have a really small group of people that know me well. And, you know, I, I kind of pass that stage in life where right now I'm not looking to, uh, I'm not looking to groom people and help them. I'm kind of in this camp and it's a little, it can be a little bit weird for people to hear, but I'm like, if you can't motivate yourself, <laughs> I'm not here to motivate you. Yeah. Um, if you are motivated, I'd like to have you on my team. That's it. That, it's, find, it's finding those people, isn't it? It's finding those people that turn up on the dark days, the shit days, you know, and, and, yep. and give the same effort. That, I mean, I do a lot on sunrise in the cold water, sunset when it's nice and the water's calm, but you got to turn up when the waves are crashing and you got to yeah, be motivated. That's right. You got to be disciplined and, and all these sorts of things that Jocko and these guys at Origin, they put that energy out there. And I try to do my bit over here in, in Scotland. But take us to big truck farms, take us to the new project, take us to what you're up to now. I mean, it, that's something I know you're started from scratch. It's not, that is not in your sort of wheelhouse knowing how to do the hops. And no, yeah, I've never, I've never, <laughs> I mean, I like land and I like being outdoors. So I started crafting. Um, these ideas about where do I want to spend my time and it always goes back to the outdoors and so we took a farm here in in Baltimore County Maryland um, and we started growing hops and we and we 
we've been doing that for six years now. And they're a finicky little plant and they're hard to grow and they're, they're a pain in the ass and a lot of labor. And then that led us to like, hey, let's, let's make our own beer because I wanted to take like agriculture and I wanted to take innovation of craft beer and I wanted to bring it together. But I wanted to bring it together for the outdoorsman. That's the difference than what we're doing at Big Truck is we're not some cheeky little craft beer brand on the shelf with a bunch of other craft beers saying, buy me, buy me. We're talking to that outdoorsman. And that's why our mascot is a big truck, because here in the States, the, the truck becomes the vehicle that brings you to the outdoors. It's like an icon. And, uh, you know, I like that consumer. I like that outdoor consumer. I understand it because I, I live it every day and we're just having fun with it, man. We're making really good. I'm not a big drinker. I don't promote drinking. We don't run and operate a bar. We don't serve vodka and wine. We have really good craft beer. Uh, and we do, we're going to have trail runs and we're going to have archery shoots and we're going to like earn a beer. Take yeah. us someplace amazing and earn it. That's it right there. That's big truck farms. Awesome. That is awesome. Can I ask you, I'm not going to keep you too much long, uh, Kip, but I've got my notes in front of me and I, I'll never forgive myself if I don't ask you about any given Sunday. Take me back to Under <laughs> Armour. What happened? That movie, I love that movie. Uh, Jamie Foxx. You know, what's funny is they were, they were filming that movie right close to us. And so we were bringing them, it just, it's like perfect timing. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't a part of it, but I helped make some of the shirts. But Kevin and some of the sports marketing guys, they just started getting like getting stuff there. They had a relationship with a costume uh, designer. And anyway, this costume designer got our shirts to, to uh, the, 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 the crew that was going to outfit the team. And then, you know, you get some of the big names wearing it and then everybody's wearing it and then we made their uniforms the next thing you know we're taking over this whole movie with Under Armour and we didn't really know much about it and then it becomes this cult football film yeah. and you know football is in Under Armour DNA American football not not European football we call it soccer here in the states yes my son plays soccer he doesn't play football <laughs> um but it just kind of like perfect timing but you know what Kevin saw an opportunity and he did not let it go. And he gave them whatever they needed and he gave it to them fast and furious. He basically made it impossible for them to say no. Yeah. And, and I that, think they even bought the stuff. It wasn't freebies. And did that propel? No. Did that how did that propel the, the brand? Was it huge? You know, I think I think that and our first Sports Illustrated um, ad, a couple things happened all together. And it just snowballed. It snowballed from there. And is there truth in the story that Kevin went to Atlantic City and put a lot of money on, was it black, when the company was real young and he didn't know how he was going to pay, pay the bills going forward? Is that a true story? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he has a little bit of a gambling background. <laughs> what does he? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit goes along with taking risk, right? We needed money. He wanted to go to Atlantic City. He wanted to make some extra money. And it didn't go that way. And he lost all his money. And he didn't even have enough money to get back over the, 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 the bridge and the toll. So, yeah, he lost it all. He didn't make it all. And what were you thinking at that point? What were you thinking? Saying, geez, what? He didn't tell me at the time. He told me years later. He, <laughs> he, I, I, I had 30 credit cards. And we ran up probably three or $400,000 of credit on my credit cards. And uh, that's how we did it for a while. What would you say to somebody now that's got this idea that wants to, that has a vision these days that wants to take it huge, wants to go global? What would you say? Someone asked me that question recently, so I'm prepared. Um, <laughs> are you willing to suffer? Mm. That's what I'd say to them. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's just, there, there's I was no other way to do it. that I was going to be, I was going to be in debt. I was scared that we weren't going to make it. I was anxious working three different jobs. I was tired as fuck. I never saw my family. I, I have a tremendous amount of guilt. My mom passed away. She had ovarian cancer. We were starting Under Armour. I was never around. I wasn't there for my mom. 
Well, are you willing to fucking suffer? If you, if the answer is that, at least you got the first step right. If you're not willing to suffer and you think you're going to be big, you can go fuck off. It ain't going to happen. Kip, that is a, it's a strong end to the podcast. <laughs> it's a strong well, end. I mean, you know, for the kids at home, you should, you know, we'll take out the F word. No, that's, that's the clip. That's, that's going out because that, that's what maybe a lot of people need to hear. I mean, you've, you've been there and done it and you're on to the next thing and you're on to your passion project now. I mean, it's, it's inspiring yeah. to see that now you do every day what you want to do. You're able to put one life behind you. You parked it and now you move on. You know, and I think there's a lot of people. Yeah, and, and we're, my brother and I and a bunch of guys that work for me uh, come spring because the hops come up in the spring. I got to, next week, I got to tie 17,000 strings. Yeah. I'm not going to hire someone to do that. You're in. You're all in. I'm in because I'm willing to suffer. It sucks. It's the most mind numbing job ever. 17,000 strings. I, I want to say something about you. I'm, I'm glad you reached out and uh, I'm glad we did the podcast. I can tell you got a good vibe. I hope you fucking crush it. And uh, if you ever need me, man, just let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kip. I really appreciate that. I really do. Yeah, man. Well, good all right. Luck. Well, have a good, good one. Luck. Let me know how it goes. I will. All the best. All right. Cheers.